God is with us. Here we find new life. Good morning and welcome to First Church of Christ in Simsbury. I am Pastor George Harris, joined as I always am by Rev. Kev Weichel. Uh, it's always a joy to be here with you this morning. Uh, I think all of you no doubt know that we are still in our temporary worship environment of Palmer Hall, uh, not yet ready to move back into our sanctuary. I know Kevin and I regularly affirm the uh, value of worship here, and yet we also miss terribly our beautiful sanctuary. And one thing I makes me insane is that this candle goes right under the, the, the fan and regularly blows out. And so, excuse me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so again, welcome, whether you're worshiping with us in person or whether you're uh, online with us. Uh, you know, it happens from time to time, and it just happened this week, that somebody will email uh, the church and say, you know, I've been worshiping with you online for a couple years, and I'd really love to come and worship in person. Would that be okay? Um, <laughs> My goodness, and it's just a reminder that we really don't know who's out there, and, um, and we want to, and we want to get to know you. There are opportunities, if you're on Facebook with us, to uh, kind of say something in the comments section. If you are uh, not well-known to the church, you could always like put your name in there. Uh, we would be happy to follow up with you in some way, but just know that um, even if we don't know you by name, uh, we are present with you in worship on this Sunday morning, and welcome. We are a United Church of Christ, often called UCC Church. Uh, we are open and affirming, which means we seek to be intentional in our welcome of everybody, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. I've noticed some folks returning after their summer on the Cape or elsewhere, and so what a delight that is. Uh, welcome. It's great to see people back. Um, I, uh, Kevin will share some announcements a little bit later in the service, but I want to put a couple things out there briefly now so you have time to think about them. Uh, we will be taking, uh, this, this is World Communion Sunday, that's why all this beautiful bounty is here. Thanks to uh, Penny Roskin and the worship board for their extra attention to uh, the presentation this morning. So this is a Sunday when churches around the world are celebrating communion together and celebrating church unity. Christian unity, recognizing that regardless of the differences amongst us, that we all come together around the table. Um, so we take a special offering on this Sunday. It's called Neighbors in Need, and Rev Kev will talk more about that. There's an envelope in your bulletin if anyone is uh, wanting to make a donation to that. The other thing is that we, following this service, are having an orientation for newcomers, visitors, friends of the church, um, it is information that you would want to know if you would consider membership in the church, but it's not a sales pitch. And uh, even if you're just attending to find out more about this church that you've been attending, that's okay too. Um, some of you have RSVP'd. I think we have eight or nine people already signed up to attend, but even if you were not able to RSVP and you're just hearing about it for the first time, you are, you are welcome. We serve a light lunch of sandwiches and um, I hope cookies, and, um, and, then, and then go into a short presentation about the church, which gives you a chance to ask questions and uh, just uh, engage and get to know us a little bit better. So that would be immediately following the service, just go out the store, go up the stairs, wind around to your right and find the classroom there where the people are. Um, oh, and we have new chairs. So, yay, yay, almost got, an, almost got applause for the new chairs. So um, um, we're grateful for the, the evolution and the, the movement of the spirit in this church. Let us be together in prayer. Lord, throughout the world today, Christians are sharing in the sacrament of Holy Communion. We come together with a bountiful table set in the midst of struggle and strife. Help us to receive the elements of bread and wine for, 
bread and cup for the nourishment of our souls and for the strengthening of our witness to your love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able for our call to worship. God, who is one, you call us to be one. May we be one with all who are made in your image. God, who is three, you call us to be community. May we find community with all who are called by your name. God, who calls us all by your name. God Almighty, today, by the power of your Spirit, we unite in prayer. We unite with all our sisters and brothers in Christ. We unite with sisters and brothers from all Christian churches and denominations. We unite with all who are joined by the Holy Spirit of God. We unite with followers from every church and congregation. be seated. Each week we gather together to collect the places, to think about, reflect on the places in our lives where we fall short, where we miss the mark. In so doing, we invite God to heal and mend those broken places so we might live more lovingly and fully. Let us join together in our unison prayer of confession. We have not been your people, preparer of peace. When we could see our brother Jesus and others, we turn away from those who are unlike us, who scare us. When we could offer peace to those around us, we break our promises. We hoard grudges in our hearts. We pander to prejudice. When we could speak of hope, we fling words that shatter another's heart. 
when we could live as one with all people, we try to push them as far away from us as possible. Redeem us, lover of peace, and pour out your grace upon us. May the warmth of your tenderness melt our frozen souls. May the balm of your words mend any broken hearts we have damaged. May we be as trusting and vulnerable as a little child as we follow Jesus Christ, our Lord, our brother, into your kingdom of joy. God wants us to be whole and well and at peace, and so God forgives our sins, collects our confessions, and forgives us. With grace and mercy, God gifts us, and for this, we give thanks to God. Amen.
I'm going to say just a couple words of introduction to this scripture passage. I'm only preaching on the first couple verses, but I actually want to address the, the last three or four verses. Um, this text, in many versions and translations, makes references to uh, slaves. And um, I am not alone in uh, finding such references in the Bible. Uh, challenging because it's really hard to separate them from our own cultural context and our own national experience with enslavement. Um, of course, it's referring to a Roman institution that's entirely different than, than our American context. But like I said, I, I know I am not alone in sometimes finding uh, that language um, so difficult to translate and overcome. And it's not the only translation in versions of the Bible. So I'm reading this morning from um, a perfectly respected translation version called the Common English Bible that uses the word servant instead of slave. And I, I just take the time to share that because I want to give you permission to know that you can um, take these texts and, and ask these questions of them and that it's okay. So hear these words from the Gospel of Luke. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord rep replied, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Would any of you say to your servant who had just come in from the field after plowing or tending sheep, come, sit down for dinner? Wouldn't you say instead, fix my dinner, put on the, cloth, the clothes of a table servant, and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you can eat and drink. You wouldn't thank the servant because the servant did what you asked, will you? In the same way, when you have done everything required of you, you should say, we servants deserve no special praise. We have only done our duty. This is the word of God. From time to time, I talk about the homeless ministry I began while serving a church in Honolulu. This is where I experienced my call to ministry. But I talk less about the jobs I had before that. Two jobs leading nonprofit programs and organizations, one serving street youth in Waikiki and the other providing volunteer support to people living with AIDS. Though these were secular organizations, this is really where I first discovered what it means to minister to people who are hurting. The program I led for street youth was a drop-in center called Youth Outreach, or YO! Exclamation point. <laughs> a special act from the legislature allowed us to serve youth age 15 to 21 without parental consent. This was done with the understanding that those we served had no safe home or family to return to. The young adults were often thrown out on their 18th birthday, while the minors often stayed out all night to avoid chaos and violence at home. Working out of a rare 
old single family home on a side street in Waikiki, we would serve a hot meal three times a day, or three times a week, excuse me, operated a small clinic, and provided case management to support the youth in transitioning back to a safer setting should they be ready. We saw it all. The minor girls would be preyed upon by pimps. The young men would prey upon tourists, either petty theft or by hustling young women on vacation into taking care of them. Drug use was near universal. Of course, weed, but also crystal meth, inhalants like nail polish and heroin. The police knew about us and supported our mission, so rarely came by the house. We promoted a warm, non-judgmental, loving atmosphere that kept the youth coming back. I still remember all their names and stories. Though life on the street had forced them to assume a certain toughness, each one was sensitive, loving, and so very smart in their way. There were artists, poets, future lawyers, and more than a few budding counselors. After building trust over time, some would allow us to make referrals to drug treatment or into transitional housing. And for others, it was just a matter of having a safe haven for long enough for external circumstances to change. For example, a mom's boyfriend who had been molesting her 16-year-old daughter goes back to jail for a probation violation, allowing the girl to return home. Of course, it could be heartbreaking. I remember this incredibly bright and wise young Hawaiian woman, Kaliko, who had terrible addi addiction issues, but she blossomed under the love and attention we gave her. We got her into residential treatment, and she came out so full of life. I have quoted her in sermons before, talking about a meditation that she learned in treatment, to listen for the birds wherever you are. Wherever you are. If you quiet yourself enough and listen for the birds, you will hear them. Sadly, the last memory I have of Coleco was after she had relapsed, and we were walking together down Kalakala Avenue as she huffed into a plastic bag of nail polish. At Yo, we had no illusions of being saviors. I learned two things about the relationships I formed there with these remarkable young people. First, sometimes less is more. These youth were rightfully suspicious of anyone who swooped in with a lot of shoulds, presuming to solve all their problems. At their young age, they had been in the system for years and seen this before and knew better than their workers all the pitfalls that lay ahead. Rather, a casual, warm, genuine engagement with their current situation helped establish and build a relationship. This was really tricky because it meant being present, whether a girl was telling you that she was thinking about going back to get her GED or that she had started stripping. That doesn't mean we needed to approve of the stripping, but we also couldn't react with harsh judgment because their choice may be the best they were able to make in their circumstance. Even subtle judgment would reinforce hurtful messages that they had received about themselves throughout their young lives. Second, and a corollary, to less is more is, we didn't have all the answers and likely couldn't solve their problems in the short time we had together. Chances are the youth would depart from Yo still bearing terrible burdens. That doesn't mean they would stay stuck forever. We would hear enough stories to be reassured that some moved on to something better, if not happily ever after. And when one of the youths was able to circle back, they would always affirm the importance of having had a safe place with loving people to accompany them through their most difficult passage. Service providers have a name for this approach, harm reduction. Instead of assuming that the immediate goal is complete recovery from what ails a person, the goal is to establish a trusting, non-judgmental relationship, the provision of relative safety, and the opportunity to take small steps in a better direction. For drug use, the goal might be using less in a safer environment rather than complete abstinence. While at Yo, I spent time vol volunteering at a needle exchange program that provided addicts clean syringes in return for their used ones. This dramatically cut the incidence of transmission of HIV and hepatitis C. And here again, the caring relationships established during the visits to exchange needles 
provided access to treatment resources when the person was ready. Needle exchange is a classic example of harm reduction. Now, a harm reduction perspective can sometimes challenge Christians. After all, didn't Jesus arrive whole from the tomb all at once? Yes, and we're not Jesus. And the idea that we experience redemption and renewal a bit at a time while being held safe in love is perfectly consistent with our faith. So you might be wondering about the connection I am making to this morning's scripture passage. Immediately preceding the apostles' request to Jesus to increase their faith, Jesus has told them that if someone sins against you, hurts, betrays, or lies to you, even seven times in one day, and each time that person turns back to you and repents, apologizes, commits to do better, each time you must meet them where they are and forgive them. Now, this some, sounds like some of the young people I used to work with at Yo. Again and again, they would sincerely express their determination to turn their life around. And again and again, their efforts to get out of harm's way would be foiled, not because they were bad people, but most often by external factors and their own limitations. So clearly, Jesus' command to forgive in this way seems too hard for the apostles, impossible to live up to. So they ask Jesus for more faith. Now, I read faith in passages like this to mean trust rather than the acceptance of a religious truth. They are saying, help us trust enough to respond, to remain present in these tough situations. Jesus' response to them is not what they had hoped for. He says, in effect, less is more. You don't need anything more from me than what you already have. Simply being genuine, caring, and present in response to someone's troubles, even the worst kinds of troubles, stripping or injecting heroin, you have all you need. A mustard seed of faith, of trust, is all you need. That's what the people that walked into Yo or the Needle Exchange had, a mustard seed of faith. Their faith wasn't expressed as an assent to a religious doctrine, not, I believe in Jesus as my savior. No, their faith, their trust, was expressed simply by coming back, just by returning to the source of love and safety in their lives. And in return, we who work there demonstrated our trust by simply being present in love. Now, perhaps you're still looking for a connection for yourself here. While you may find the stories of street youth and needle exchanges interesting, what does that have to do with us here in church this morning? Well, quite a bit, I suggest. We don't need to be street youth or injection drug users to apply these lessons of less is more. First, addictions, bad habits, and compulsions are all too common across socioeconomic class. Some are familiar, like drugs, alcohol, gambling, eating disorders, and porn. But we have other hurtful and risky habits that, despite our best intentions, are hard to break. Abusive behavior, overspending, extramarital affairs. If you don't have any of these, perhaps you find yourself in the position of the apostles being asked to forgive someone who is struggling again and again and again. If you are on the receiving end of hurtful behavior, it is one thing to be present in love as a case manager, and much harder still if you are loving someone through such behavior as a parent or spouse. We are even more tempted to respond with expectations that we can somehow help and fix and also with implied or over judgment, and sometimes with a lot of hurt and anger. Now, certainly there are times to act assertively, so I am cautious about preaching a one-size-fits-all response to hurtful behavior. But it is at least worth asking if less might be more, if simply being present in love could provide the time and space someone needs to come to terms with an issue on their own, that your love coupled with their own desire to change, the movement of the spirit, and the passage of time 
would bring a shift, just as it would for youth at Yo. This isn't just about bad habits. Sometimes it's just a matter of letting go of our own way. Many of you know that our daughter Abby is home from college on medical leave. Well, she's almost 20 and expects all the freedom that comes with being a college junior. What she wants is not unreasonable for a young adult to make her own decisions about what to do when without asking permission, to spend weekends with her boyfriend, to go out with friends we don't know to do we know not what. She is living under our roof and her health issues cause her to remain dependent on us in many ways. So to say it is a challenge to let go is an understatement. But locking her in her room is not the answer, <laughs> even if such a thing were possible. So here too, less is more, and harm reduction wins the day, which requires sitting with a lot of anxiety and not acting on it. Trusting that our love, coupled with her own desire to make good decisions, the movement of the spirit, and the passage of time will allow her to grow as any young person must. As I said, there are times to speak up and assert ourselves, whether at home or in the public square. But the older I get, the more I realize that it's not all up to us, that we can listen more than we talk, that we can be present in love without insisting on our own way. And whether we are grappling with hurtful habits, which we do, or loving someone who grapples with hurtful habits, which we do, or whether we are just trying to accept our limitations, the faith, the trust we have is sufficient. Our faith, our trust is expressed by simply coming back, just by returning to the source of love and safety in our lives. And in our tradition, this source of love and safety is God, as made known to us in Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. We've come to the time in our worship when we 
share together the celebrations and concerns of our lives, our community, and our world. I will mention uh, any new names or updates since the last time we were together, and then uh, invite us to take a moment to pray, pray over uh, the list. Um, also, uh, during that time, for you to think of uh, any prayers that come up upon your heart that you'd like to share aloud. We celebrate with the Oros family on the birth of their uh, new nephew and cousin, Cal Vito. We pray comfort and strength and healing for those who are sick, recovering from surgery, or undergoing treatment, including uh, Latoya as she recovers and heals from a dislocated shoulder, uh, as well as uh, Dwayne and Shirley Prater, parents uh, of Latoya, as they face new health challenges together. Uh, we continue to pray for uh, Cale Connaughton as he recovers from successful eye surgery, and for Abby Harris as she continues her journey with brain cancer, and Marissa Campanetti uh, that she remains cancer free. Prayers of solace and peace for the family of Alice Daly. Alice passed uh, away for, uh, this last week. Her memorial service will be held here this coming Saturday. October 8th, and for the Granger family on the passing of Christine's father, Kirk Kim. For our wider community and world, of course, uh, the victims of the recent hurricanes in Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Florida, uh, we pray for all the families of those that have died and for those that um, were left injured or homeless and destitute or without clean drinking water. And we pray for speedy help and a long-term commitment to rebuilding and restoration. And so for those at home, uh, you're welcome to type your prayers in the comments. For those here, um, what I'd like you to ask is if, if you uh, want to just take a moment to pray over the list, and then I'll ask what prayers you might have to share. Prayers come upon your hearts this morning that have not been mentioned aloud. Jill. Penny and Ken, 50 years. Wonderful. <laughs> Joey. We're glad to have you back, but we're, we're grateful that you had that experience and you felt uh, your son's love as uh, he remains with you on your heart. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in case I don't come into this next Sunday in the service, um, I want to just say a prayer for Kate. She has surgery the following Monday. It's not major surgery, but, you know, that everything goes well. Prayers for Kate, who has surgery the following Monday. But Luann, I have to ask, why wouldn't you come to church next week? <laughs> yes, Bill. For the people of Florida, as they uh, end Cuba, Puerto Rico, as they recover from the hurricane, and all the other people affected across the country and in the Caribbean. Yeah, yeah, all those impacted by the hurricane. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Press for Eek is Sister Nellie. Thank you. Yes. I pray for me and my family to like, that diagnosis of epilepsy and um, my family's 
struggling to help me out and um, just got back to driving. So now I serve. Well, it's, it's good to see you here. It's good to have you here among us. And we will pray for you and your diagnosis and for your family as they support you. Yeah, you're in our prayers. The Lord be with you. Holy One, we lift all of our prayers, those spoken aloud and also those offered in silence, those too deep for words. We offer them to you, trusting that you receive them as you receive us with arms wide open. On this World Communion Sunday, as we prepare to gather around this wonderful <coughs> meal, and as people do so in everywhere and every place, churches across your world, we ask you to bless us all, your children, as we eat this bread and drink this cup, linking arms around the world, we ask you to pour your grace into each of our hearts. We ask that we may see in each other your light, your love, you. May it not matter our differences, our names, our languages, our looks, our way of doing things. May what matter today and every day be that we are one in you. And as we pray, we call to mind our brothers and sisters who are unable to be with us today, whether in body or spirit. May you bring comfort to those who are grieving, lonely, heartbroken, ill, or broken in spirit. May you strengthen those whose lives feel shattered, don't make sense, in crisis, experiencing loss. May you say the healing word to those who need it. And may you bring the human touch of love to those who have not been touched. May you love those who feel unloved. May you shine your light into those whose world is covered in darkness. And may you, you use us to feed the hungry, clothe the ones who need clothes. Give a cup of water to those who are thirsty. Shelter the homeless, visit the sick, and those who are in prison. May our lives be awakened to you, O Holy One, to your love, to your kingdom, whose door is always open to all. Amen. Pastor George mentioned um, the new member orientation, which is happening right uh, after church uh, this morning. Also, we have fellowship hour, so we hope to see you in one of those places. Also, um, anyone feeling strong today? And anybody want to get in the, in the fall spirit, the Halloween spirit? I, I know you do. I know you do. Kingston, yes. Two o'clock. We have plans for you. Two o'clock. Uh, over at the pumpkin patch, the truck is coming from New Mexico. Uh, that's where our pumpkins come from. That's why they're so unique. And um, they uh, are uh, uh, raised on the Navajo Native American Reservation. So they're making their way. They'll be here at 2 o'clock. So it's pumpkin delivery day. And it's hard work. It's a lot of hard work. So um, it, it, these, are, that's, these are our youth group plans for today, JF and PF. Um, and also, we can use uh, all hands on deck. If, if you're looking at your watch and you say, yeah, it's about 2 o'clock, and uh, you can make your way down here, um, we, would, we would appreciate the help. Um, and um, also, uh, for our offering today, we have a special offering. You'll see in your envelopes um, a Neighbors in Need offering. 
Um, it's a special offering of our denomination, the United Church of Christ, and it supports ministries of justice and compassion um, in our denomination. Um, so let us now, uh, out of gratitude for our denomination and also a gratitude for the ministries of this local congregation, um, let us receive our gifts and our offerings. Gracious and loving God, we give these gifts that this church might continue to be a place of safety and love for all who enter here, and that we, in stepping out in faith, might make this world a place of safety and love as we seek to follow in the footsteps of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Those themes that I lifted up in my sermon, being present in love, creating a safe place, uh, that there uh, is sometimes more in doing less and just being present. Those are all themes that are represented here at this table. Uh, this table doesn't require that we talk that we try to make sense. This table doesn't require anything except that we step forward with arms and hearts and hands open, ready to receive the gifts of God. 
on this day of all days with all God's children in every corner of the world. May we share this abundant cup with all those who thirst for justice. May we share abundant bread with all those who hunger for righteousness. May we be united in hope, united in vision, united in purpose, united in ministry in every place. This table is for all of us, near and far, high and low, east and west, and north and south. This table is for all of us, but it is not our table. It is not a first church table. It's not an American table. It's God's table for all of us, and it's a table of grace. So come and take your place at the table. You are welcome. You are invited. You are called. Come, let us share this meal together. Let us pray. It is our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O God, creator and ruler of the universe. Even when we were dust, you were there. Your word was there. When we were in the wilderness, terrified, timid, you were there. Your word was there. With manna just enough for the day with water from even the driest rock. When we fell short, slaves to power and greed, you were there. Your word was there on the lips of prophets and in the hearts of servants and the stories of revolution and revelation and liberation, calling us even now to acts of courage and witness and peace. Therefore, we praise you joining our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all the faithful of every time and place. Blessed are you, O Christ, for risking yourself among us, vulnerable and rejected, for teaching among us, teaching the radical hope of God. You speak to us again here at this table. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, upon these your gifts of bread and cup, that the bread we break together, the cup we share together, may retell our common stories and reshape our bonds. May together we remember your grace. May we remember your son, Jesus Christ, the one in whose life and death you have torn down our divisions. Let us now pray together the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So we tell the story as it is today being told around the world, as it has been told for thousands of years, that on the night he was to be betrayed, Jesus came to the table with his disciples, his friends, for what he knew would be the last time. In the midst of that meal, Jesus took the bread. When he had given thanks, he offered it to his disciples, his followers, and he said, this bread represents my body that will soon be broken for each and all of you. He says, I break this bread such that you know that every time this bread is broken, that I will be present with you in love. He said, take and eat of this in remembrance of me. I offer you the bread. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And after giving thanks, he poured it out for his disciples, and he said, Drink, each of you. And when you drink, remember that this is the new covenant, the cup of the new covenant. Ministering to you in Christ's name, we give you the cup. Communion this morning will be uh, by intinction. You will be um, invited forward, uh, pointed out by the rush ushers as to uh, when you can come. Um, you can take a piece of bread then move and dip it in the cup, and then prayerfully return um, back to your seats. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Commission Prayer of Thanksgiving. Thanks be to you, O oh God, for your presence, loving kindness, and transforming spirit. May the blessings of this table strengthen our faith, call us to Christ's service, and unify our hearts for Jesus' sake. Say one more time that uh, anyone who is interested in attending the orientation for newcomers and visitors and friends may find your way um, up the stairs into the classroom uh, on the second floor. And everyone else is invited to linger. I understand that fellowship hour is serving bread and toast with jam. So um, there, 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 there is um, uh, going to be a wonderful spread of different kinds of breads with jam and I don't know, maybe marmalade. Um, so, friends, may the spirit of the living God made known most fully to us in Jesus Christ go before you to show you the way, go above you to watch over you, go behind you to nudge you into places you might not go by yourselves, go beneath you to uphold and uplift you, and go beside you to be your strong and constant companion that you may know that you are never, ever alone and that you are loved love beyond your wildest imagination. And may the fire of God's blessing burn brightly upon you and within you today and always. <laughs>